My name is Elise Shadler, and I work with the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation and the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. Um, and in a world without emerald ash borer, my job is to work with municipalities on the management and care of public trees. So uh, before EAB, I did a lot of tree inventory work and public policy development and management planning, all that jazz. And then um, the past couple months, as you can imagine, have been pretty much dominated by this small green beetle. Um, also from, so just, uh, just to kind of go over who's here, Danielle Fitzko is my co-presenter. A lot of people know Danny. Um, program manager with the Urban Community Forestry Program, based on Montpelier. I'm based out of Essex um, Junction. You want to say anything? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bonnie Wanager is with the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Um, and so we worked with Bonnie to coordinate this, uh, this municipal training. Do you want to say anything, Bonnie? Just welcome and thank you for coming out. I know you'd rather be building snowmen. Uh, Emerald Ash Board, just as good. Um, towards the end, I'd like to talk about our inventory sort of, and management plan assistance that cool. we can provide. Great, so I'll give you the floor at the end of our talks. Um, and I'm just going to throw this up right off the bat. These two websites, going to mention them a lot tonight. There is a table of swag in the back if you haven't already explored it. The main point of those items is so you walk out of here with something that has VT invasives on it and something that has VT community forestry on it. Um, those are our two sites with everything that you have in the packet that you have in front of you is on those websites. So uh, just, just kind of the one-stop shop for everything and all things EAB. Um, to walk you through our, our intended agenda for the day, I am going to do a presentation on kind of the story of EAB, and you know, for many of you, this is just going to be a refresher. Um, but for some of you, maybe you will learn something new. Danielle will talk about uh, Vermont's response and all of the slowing the spread recommendations. We'll then get into planning strategies and management strategies for municipalities. Um, I'm going to ask John to come up and talk a little bit about Montpelier, just so you get a, a sense for a town that really has gone through the full planning process and has a plan. Uh, we're going to break out after that into some small groups, do a little activity and a group share, and get you out of here by 6. Um, I put questions at the end, but please just interrupt. Like This is a, definitely a dialogue, so as we go through, um, there is going to be a lot of information. Again, a lot of it might be old news to you. Some of it might be brand new, so if you want to ask questions, please just go ahead and do that. Um, and I guess the overall goal of this presentation, this workshop, is, is uh, to get you to wrap your heads around um, what it looks like to manage emerald ash borer on, for, for, for a municipality. So when I'm talking about municipal trees, I'm talking about public trees. So these are the trees in the public right-of-way. These are the trees around your municipal buildings, your public parks, your cemeteries. Um, if your town manages school property, it's those trees as well. So uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, private property, um, touch on landowner issues, but for the most part, we are, we are focused on that public realm tonight. Um, so with that, I'm gonna start Actually, before we do that, I'd love to do just a very quick round. Um, name, town, and your role. Okay. All right, Steve Lotspeech from Waterbury. I'm the tree warden and also the community planner for the town. Um, Brad Tobin, uh, Plainfield, I'm the uh, road commissioner. Paul Kate, I'm on the town forest committee and tree warden. For East Montpelier. East Montpelier. <laughs> John Akulashik with, with the Montpelier Tree Board and also so that they're point person for EAB. Uh, I'm Ginger Anderson and I'm actually the district forest manager for Forest and Parks for this area, but I also am a resident of Berlin and been asked to help with an inventory for Berlin. So I'm, I guess I'm wearing that hat tonight. Fred Hahn, I live in Berry City. I represent Cambridge Town Forest Committee. Roland Payne. I'm from Cabot. I'm the tree warden in town. I'm also a forest past first detector. Yes, if you're a first detector, let us know. John, you're also. 
I'm Otis Monroe, Southern Windsor Regional Planning. Um, I usually do emergency management for them, but they sent me to learn about this, but I don't anyone who's done it. So. <laughs> I'm Bill McKnight, Plainfield. I'm a, a landowner with contested trees. Um, I'm Steve Long from Corinth, and I'm on the select board. Virginia Barlow from Corinth, and I'm the tree warden. Uh, Ken, Ken Bushy from Berkshire and the Planning Commission. Uh, Hank Lambert, Swanton, uh, tree warden. Uh, Rich Turner from Williamstown on the Planning Commission. Um, first uh, detector, best first detector, and sole tree steward. Eleanor Sue, first year Planning Commission. I'm Joanne Garten, I live in Montpelier, and I work with the Urban and Community Forestry Program. Mm -hmm. I'm Jen Bear, I work for the Shipman Salt Waste District in Williston. I live in Richmond. I'm here because it's very possible that, sadly, when the chips <laughs> when these trees get chipped up, mm. um, we will be getting a lot of that for compost, so we're sort of keeping an eye on how this is going down. Eileen Wang is Stone Town Manager for Berrytown, and our public works superintendent tended to be here, but he's sick, so I'm trying to cover both of them. Sarah Hoffmeyer, uh, Montpelier Tree Board, and my real job is uh, a landscape designer, too, so there's a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm Rick Dyer, I'm the Lamoille County Forester, I live in Calus, and I'm here just to make sure I can help counts assist them <clears throat> being prepared for dashboard when it hits. Neil Monteith, I work at Forest Health, Forest Parks, and Rack, I'm the tree warden, Peach, and uh, we're planning to do something here soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nancy Schaefer, I'm the Planning Commission, and I work with the Central Warrior. So there are a lot of towns represented in here, which is really exciting, and not just from central Vermont. So um, great swath of participants. So I'm going to start with a quick story of Emerald Ashbor. Um, has anyone in here not heard? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you got to ask. Um, this is not a real emerald ash borer. This is um, <laughs> this is our costume. If you ever want to borrow this, FYI, um, it's available. We had a, a, one of our volunteers in Johnson made us uh, a couple of these. So um, if you leave here with nothing else, know that you can borrow an EAB costume. Um, this is, in fact, the emerald ash borer. So it is a um, very uh, beautiful pest, actually. It's, it's iridescent green. Um, it is uh, about the size of a penny, smaller than a penny. A very small pest. It uh, hails from northern China, Mongolia, Japan, originally. Um, when it first came, when it was first discovered in the US, we, we, we knew nothing about it. No one really knew anything about this pest. So. Um, everything that's, that uh, we know now, all the information about EEB, is really based on the efforts of researchers and municipalities and the feds and the states um, in the past 20 years since it's been um, in the U.S. Um, the way that EEB kills ash trees, and it does kill 99.8% of ash trees that are untreated, um, is that it essentially cuts off its circulatory system. So the, the larva, uh, in the larval stage, the pest um, eats the phloem of the tree. So if you know anything about tree biology, the phloem is the layer just under the bark, and that's where all of the nutrient and water exchange is happening uh, within the tree. And uh, so it's not the adult beetle, it's not this version of the beetle that is actually doing the most damage, it's the, it's the larvae, it's the, the babies. Um, and, and essentially, as they feed, they create these galleries, these feeding galleries. Um, and at low levels, the tree can still function and, and um, it, can, it can recover. But uh, within a few short years, the populations bump up. And uh, you see 
basically the, the tree becomes girdled um, from these feeding galleries. So I'm going to pass around. I have a couple things to pass around, and these are ah! Danny. Ah! <laughs> um, let me grab those guys. So we'll pass around. I have two sets of. Um, no. Save these. Um, two sets of um, vials with a, a adult and a pupil stage uh, EAB, so you can see what how small they are and what they look like. And then these are just two examples of. Um, at pieces of ash wood that have been uh, impacted by the larvae. So you see that those tunnels. And we'll start on that one from the back, maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> um, EAB feeds on, as far as we know, all species of Native American ash. So every all trees within the Fraxinus genus. Um, that's about 16 different species across the United States. But in the Northwest, we have three major, or sorry, Northeast. <laughs> in the Northeast, we have three major ash species, the green, the white, and the black ash. Um, so in Vermont, those are the three we're really talking about that are gonna be impacted, um, and um, EAB will attack all three of them. Uh, there is another tree that uh, is just worth mentioning that has been found to be a host for EAB, and that's the, the white fringe tree, which is a chiananthus. It's a small ornamental tree that we don't really find planted much in the landscape in Vermont. It doesn't, it's not hardy for our, most of our climate. So um, it's more of an issue for like the mid-Atlantic states. It, that's, a, it's a, that's a tree species that's often planted as an ornamental in yards. But um, just so you know, there is one other host species that we know of, and that's the fringe tree. Um, to kind of walk through the the life cycle of the, of the beetle. Um, this is obviously, again, an enlarged view, but um, the actual pest is, as you're all seeing, really, really tiny as in the adult stage. In the, the summer, in the late summer, the adult beetles, um, after eating the leaves of the ash tree, the females will lay their eggs um, in, the, in the little grooves on the ash bark. And then um, the larvae, when they hatch, they will burrow into right under the, underneath the bark, and they feed as they grow, creating those galleries. And um, the life cycle can be a one to two year overwintering phase. So at low levels of infestation, um, it actually will often take two full um, winters for the for the um, lar the pupa to go through all of its larval stages. Um, but when the population levels uh, are higher, um, that, that shortens. So, so it's a one to two year range. Um, once you have high population levels, you're really seeing that one year overwintering. Um, the, when the larvae is ready to come out of the tree, it uh, exits through a D-shaped hole, which um, that's the, we have some examples of what that looks like. And if you can, you know, if you've been around long enough talking about EAB, we used to really say, look for the D-shaped holes, but as you'll see, they're really, really tiny. They're about three millimeters across. And, and they're not outlined in red. And they're not outlined in red. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so they're, they are, um, they are really hard to de <clears throat> detect. Compounded on that, uh, EAB will often start investing at the, the top of the tree in the canopy. Um, and, and the reason we think that is is that the adults are eating the leaves in the canopy. And when the, they mate and the female wants to go lay her eggs, she's just walking down the branch, finding a place on the main stem to, uh, to lay those eggs. It's not until the population levels increase enough that there's not enough space or there's not enough um, food for the, the larvae up top that they'll start to migrate down the bowl of the trunk. So, um, so if once you're seeing those D-shaped holes at the base of the trunk, at eye level where you're standing, it's likely that that tree has been infested for quite some time. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, the life cycle. It is the life cycle. And, and we just thought, we, we actually just added these slides to just do a really quick overview of some signs and symptoms. Because one of the things people are asking, what can we do? It's start looking out for these signs and symptoms. We are in the infested area here um, in Barrie. And um, we are at the cusp. So you know, I'm going to show a slide in a couple moments about um, kind of the pattern we've seen with population levels over time. So right now, we know it's in the area. Um, but it's really hard to see it. So, uh, 
So things that you can be looking for, the, the biggest indicator that's been really helpful in, um, you can see this from the highway if you're, looking, if, you're, if you're training your eyes to it, is this woodpecker flecking. So um, it's where essentially the woodpeckers are looking for the pupae, pu pupal stage or the, the larvae, um, and they're also kind of flecking off with their feet the bark. So, and it's not, remember where the, the larvae are right underneath the bark, so this is not deep, the deep holes, woodpecker holes. This is just this kind of blonding effect where it looks like the bark has been like dyed blonde essentially because it's been flecked off just that top layer. So the woodpecker flecking is a really good telltale sign that something's going on. Um, well, at least yeah. before you move on, can, can you mention the other um, disease or, or conditions? Yeah, that mimics this to some extent? Uh, because there's, it's this very common to have some, it, like the shaving yeah, of the bark. Right? There's, uh, um, compounding the issue of EAB is that ash in general have been declining in Vermont for um, quite some time. And um, I might even ask Danny and Neil and Ginger if you guys know. We know we, know we have ash yellows, which is a bacterial um, issue. What's the, Neil, do you know it's called smooth bark? Or what smooth. Bark. It's not a schwann. It'll be dull. Yeah. It's very common on actors. All the trees. There's also a uh, clear wing ash borer. I have the a tree that has it, and it looks just like that picture on the right. I talked it to Emily like, yeah. about it one time, and she told me that's probably what it was. Yeah, it's just the same size, but there's round exit holes. Round instead of and each And it shaped. looks exactly like that tree. <laughs> yeah. What's so, it called? Cool? Clear, clear wing, ash wing ash borer. Ash if you actually peeled the bark on that that it's you would not see those s-shaped galleries for that okay. but we get a lot of calls about about that yeah this is i mean this is all um i was just out last week um, doing the delineation survey up in milton um, for the new find up in uh, grand Isle county and we drove road all the roads in milton in a day um just scanning the roadsides and uh, there's just a lot of crappy looking ash, <laughs> but there were very few that had more than one of these signs that we felt we needed to flag. So, so just to walk through them again, the, the flecking, um, you know, right now obviously we can't see the canopy because the leaves are off, but um, thinning in the canopy, um, bark right, splitting, um, the yeah. Flecking, so woodpeckers don't do that for other bugs? Um, they they do <laughs> um, if there are certain bores that are more that bore deep into the wood. So you would see like a bigger hole that's going versus uh, versus kind of more this surface level like scraping off of of the of the um, bark. Um, bark splitting is something that is, is considered to be kind of an earlier sign. It's uh, the tree. Um, Physiologically, is trying to respond to uh, the stress of of the larvae and eating its cambial layer. Um, so, um, essentially, we'll we'll put out a response that, in some cases, can, can start to crack um, the bark. And this is this is the situation where you might be even able to see those galleries without even needing to peel back the bark. Um, epicormic branching. So these are sprouts that come off the trunk or off of branch bases. This is essentially the tree stressed out, trying to put out green because it needs to photosynthesize to live. Um, and then there's those D-shaped exit holes are something you'll see, um, again, either in the upper crown if you're early enough or uh, down at the base once the infestation level has, has bumped up. And the S-shaped gallery. So I put this kind of last because um, you won't see it unless you have an obvious bark split or if you peel back the bark. So uh, when, we get, when we get people that press the report it button on vtinvasives.org, which is how we're asking everyone to report any suspicious trees, um, that, that email goes to a variety of partners. Somebody goes out, if they see um, multiple of those other signs, they might end up peeling back the bark on the tree to, to see if we, um, you know, the tree in Montpelier, at the National Life Building, uh, which is where the Montpelier infestation was detected. Um, we went out and peeled uh, one of the trees that looked like it very likely had EB, and we couldn't find anything. <laughs> and then, um, then they ended up cutting the tree down and peeling some of the branches in the canopy, and that's when they found the galleries. So again, um, 
you know, just spot peeling, you might not see anything because you don't know exactly where, where it is. So when you're spot peeling, is that all just done from the ground? Most cases, yeah. So basically you're talking about not testing that? You yeah, I mean, you can do, if you have the means years, to do branch sampling, branch I know John will talk about this in Montpelier, um, if you can, um, if you have a bucket truck <laughs> at your disposal, it's something you can do. We certainly don't want to promote people just climbing trees that look brittle <laughs> just to get a branch sample. You know, one of the lessons for me in this early phase in Vermont is it's so hard to detect early infestations. It's just, it really is. And I, I just share that as like that tree in National Life I drove by, I worked there, and I would never have guessed. And now you now you see it though like the other ones now you're looking. I, I do, but I still it's, it's hard. It's hard, and it's hard. But we had binoculars, we peeled it. Early infestations are hard. That's why it's it's we're not we're not finding big a lot of trees to go yeah. look at right now until yeah. the populations are higher. Um, so just to give an idea of you know how many trees we're talking about in Vermont, we estimate that about five to seven percent of our native forests are white and green ash and black ash, um, mostly white and green, and that's about 160 million trees. Um, you know, for the purposes of today, we're talking more about these urban forests. Um, we have been, for the past five or so years, pretty engaged in doing street tree inventories with towns, so many of you live in towns where we've done those inventories, and that's really confined to just the, the village centers, our downtowns, um, and so these, these numbers I'm throwing up there just thinking about that urban, that downtown core, the populated areas. Um, so, you know, Hyde Park, we found four public ash trees. That's not a big deal for them. Now that does not include the rural roads in Hyde Park, but that's for their downtown. Um, Barry City, we've got 15. Waterbury Village, you know, 3%. Um, I put Burlington up there just because they have a high number, 12, 1,200, 75, but that's still only 11% of their street tree population. Um, Montpelier has about 450. Um, I don't know what that the total that is of the total, um, but again, John will talk more about what their approach is going to be. Um, and this is, you know, I just want to mention that um, for our communities, we're we're kind of seeing that three. The most towns that we've done inventories for, it's it's under 20 percent of their total tree population, which can seem like a lot, but in the Midwest and in Colorado. There are communities where 70% of their trees, their public trees, are green ash. Mm. So, um, you know, it's a species that was planted really heavily after we lost our elm trees. Um, and, and it grows really well in urban areas. It's a, just a tree that grows fast. It's very tolerant. Um, so, I'm not to diminish the uh, urgency of, of this issue and that EAB needs to be addressed, but just to give some perspective um, I think we're, the, the aesthetic and economic impact to some degree is, is less than what we've seen in, in the Midwest and um, in some of those Western communities that rely on ash as much higher percentage of their, their public tree population. These two at the bottom, um, these are estimates of rural road populations. So um, we did an estimate of 10 miles in Northfield and then Randolph did, I can't remember how many, 10%. 10% of their roads, um, and it, it more of just a kind of a dot tally, and then they extrapolated out and estimated how many trees. Um, that's Those are certainly larger numbers that um, are a little bit more scary to look at, um, 6,000 trees on, on rural roads. Uh, this does not go into the size of those trees, so they could be all mostly six inches and in smaller, um, but just, just to kind of elucidate that, you know, the rural road side is an environment where we we don't we have not historically engaged in management of that environment so much in our program, um, and it's something we're really focused on right now. Better understanding uh, what is it going to look like when we lose ash? Um, what's the most efficient way to deal with the ash along our rural roads? Um, how do we support towns in managing those those road sides? So. That's the kind of the landscape. That is my favorite ash tree in my neighborhood. Um, it's pretty. Um, this is that graph I mentioned earlier. So this is, uh, this is just demonstrating kind of what we've seen, again, from the experience of the Midwest states 
you know, one of the one of the benefits of being so late to the game is that we are able to learn so much from what um, what we, we've learned from the other states um, and, and their experiences. So we're you know we're right here. Oh, you can't do the red on the screen. It's so weird. We're right here. <laughs> we're at the cusp. Um, and, and the experience has been is that you know once EAB pops up in an area, once it's detected in an area, at about around year eight or eight to ten is when you really see that population skyrocket and you get a big peak in population. Um, and following that comes the death curve. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, ten years after the, the initial find is when you'll really start seeing the, uh, the mass die-offs of ash. So this is uh, important to, to understand, one, because it demonstrates that we have time right now. This is the time in this area to be really diving into planning and to have a plan so that when this happens, um, you, you know what, what your strategy is or you're starting on your strategy next year in anticipation of this happening. So, um, so understanding that you have time, this is the time to plan, and that um, the other thing to understand is that the die-off happens in a pretty short amount of time. So you can go from kind of, you know, I was just listening to a webinar um, out of Ohio State, and they were talking about how when EAB is first detected, there's all this energy around it, and then years go by, and there's only a couple trees that are dying here and there and here and there, and then year eight, nine, ten, all of a sudden, hundreds of trees are dying, and everyone's kind of forgotten about it, and it becomes an issue again. So again, just to make the case that um, there's a lot of energy around EAB right now, so it's time to capitalize on that and to not forget when we have these years of, of um, low mortality. I was just curious, when you're talking about um, like when making a plan, like now's the time to make a plan, are you talking about the plan to deal with the dead trees or the plan to we'll get try there. to... We'll get there. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying, I know we're going to get to the plan. Yeah. Are you talking about the plan to deal with the dead trees or the plan to try to save both. Okay. Both. Yeah. So the strategy. I'm going to lay out what the strategies are, um, and then um, make the case for you. You need to figure out where you want to fall on that strategizing. Yeah. Well, I think your, your your assessment is spot on for most towns. Unfortunately, our town Plainfield, it's probably been around for about four or five years. EAB. Yeah. So you think you're more here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which is very likely the case. I think the orange find the, those trees. It was estimated they probably have been there four or five years. Yeah, and even in the trees in Montpelier, um, we know it was at least there two, at least two years. Yeah. So yes, you're, that is that's a really good point um, for this group, particularly. Some of you are in places where you probably are more like here. What happens to the EV um, like year twelve? Why does it decrease so much? Um, it, it runs out of starts running out of food. Okay. Uh, but I, I will say that. In experience in the Midwest, it's still persisting at low levels. Um, EAB will infest feed on trees one inch in diameter. Wow. So if a tree can support one EAB, it will feed on that tree. So um, the, you know the original thought was, oh, it'll starve itself, and we'll start seeing it leaving the landscape. It's it's persisting at low levels. Um, that you know, not to say that that doesn't provide some the population levels go down dramatically, and so there there is now research around like is that a time to start introducing biocontrols mm. that can um, maybe mitigate that population a little bit more. <clears throat> um, and I just want to mention this idea of lingering ash. So um, there are there are trees that are exhibiting some degree of tolerance or resistance to EAB. And so there's, um, there's this little spectrum. Most trees, about 99% of them, ash trees, are susceptible and will die if not chemically treated. But um, in the Midwest, between 0.1 and 1% of trees um, are showing either some tolerance, which means that it takes longer for the tree to, to succumb. So that it's, it's uh, responding in a way, it's, it's basically delaying death. Um, in some ways, and then the very rare cases of trees that seem to be completely unfazed by EAB. It's 
So this is the tree um, exhibiting some kind of physiological response where it's either killing the, the EAB in its larval state, um, if it's, uh, you know, or not even like right after the eggs hatch, not able even to um, penetrate the cambial layer. So, so um, and these are these are physiological responses that the native ash in EAB's native region they they do the same thing. So um, rare, few and far between. Um, but we have learned a lot from the chestnut, American chestnut, and from American elm. Mm -hmm. And there are crossbreeding programs that are already in place um, to to really select those trees to. Um, Crossbreed them so that we have the next generation of ash eventually. But this is a this is a case. There is a case to be made if you own property. Um, you don't. You know there 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 can be a case be, to be made that you don't have to cut every tree down. Essentially, so if they're not going to be a risk to public safety, um, to property, uh, if if we cut them all down, we don't know which what trees might have some resistance. Um, this is certainly not something we're promoting in the urban environment. Um, we can't just wait and see which ones are going to um, be tolerant or not. But just worth putting in there. Um, there's a lot of research that's coming around uh, around these lingering ash. And I'm going to pass it on to Danny. This is to give Elise a break. I think I have three slides. No, you don't. <laughs> and she gets back on. Uh, so we're going to switch now to the spread of EAB. Uh, from 2002, when it was first detected in Detroit, till today, uh, and it was, as I said, in Detroit 2002, now, 2018, we're in 35 states and five provinces, so it's moved quite a bit. Those red dots are the first detection in, in counties, but you can see what a huge uh, growth of the spread of EAB over a short amount of time. Now, we think probably it was in Detroit in the 90s, uh, but it wasn't found and identified until 2002. So I don't know if you mentioned this, but naturally EAB, when it's in an adult phase and is flying, goes only about one to two miles. That's naturally its movement. And it usually doesn't even go that far if it has ash trees to feed, ash trees to feed on close by. But it can uh, move that far. So, so what's going on? Tell me. People. How are we getting around? <laughs> People, it's us. We're moving EAB around. I mean, that's that's really what's going down. It's human. It's human movement, and so um, we've tried to stop it, and it just keeps it keeps moving around. Um, oh, this is an example. Uh, this is in Salem, Salem, Mass, Mass and that's that's store right there that's a restaurant and it's a wood fired pizza uh, place mm -hmm. and they got wood delivered uh, and an arborist urban forester friend of ours you know mm -hmm. working a lot with EAB so I'm going to check out this it's in a non-infested area you know, a little closer oh. and you see it now could have been heat treated firewood but just to say that you know it, it's really easy to move around and firewood seems to be the big culprit here and you know you have a dead tree in the backyard you don't know why it died you move it to a camp and it can go you know 80 miles an hour down the road and to new, new places pretty quickly uh, so this is sort of the story of EAB in Vermont we found it first in February uh, this year in, in Orange um, since then it seems to be like we've been looking for years we had this uh, we kept saying, like, why aren't we finding it? We've been looking for so long. Maybe we have lazy woodpeckers, you know, we kept saying. Uh, but this year was the year. So uh, first found in orange, and now this is the, the spread there. And then you have all these other confirmed areas and high risk. So what this map is, is, is showcasing is what we're calling the infested areas. So the red areas are what we're calling the confirmed infested areas. And then the yellow area is what we're calling the high risk area. Mm -hmm. So the way that's defined is we know we have a tree or a set of trees or a site or a, uh, we find a, a beetle on a purple track. We know we have a hot spot. Then we draw five miles around that because based on what we've learned that we know it's probably five miles from that area. Then we draw another five miles from that boundary and call that the high risk area because that's the area where it's going to move probably 
it's at, it's at high risk. So it's a 10 mile buffer around a known infested tree or where we found a beetle. Um, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when we first found it in Vermont, we were trying to decide what the approach would be, how we'd manage EAB in the state, and we had a collaboration of partners that we're working very closely with, Agency of Ag, FPR, the Forest Service provides a lot of guidance, APHIS, which is, is where the quarantine comes from, and UVM Extension, of course, the partner in education and outreach. So we needed to make a decision in Vermont how we wanted to handle the movement of wood. And it was determined that we would go with the federal quarantine, which means it would be statewide. And that we would link up with the other states that uh, are in, under the federal quarantine. Um, so we regular, like you can move wood anywhere within the federal quarantine, which is a pretty big area. Do we have a map of that? Well, it's, uh, no, we don't. Actually, I think I may. Yeah, this blue zone here. Yeah. And actually, New Hampshire is going to be full on in the federal quarantine, probably coming out in a December map. So you can move wood without having a permit in all, all the areas outlined in blue. Uh, we also knew that APHIS was talking about deregulating EAB. And its reality is they've been trying to regulate it since 2002, 18 years later, and look at the spread. It's just not, hasn't been very successful. So our approach was let's do an education and outreach to slow the spread and use those infested areas as the area where we want to really slow the spread. We're considering those infested areas as trees that are potentially or infested with EAB and we don't want to, we don't want trees that are wood that is not treated leaving the site. So this is what it looks like. The movement of wood applies to the infested area. Uh, we have recommended practices by product, whether it's firewood, whether it's chips, logs, uh, and we also, the recommendations go from the, whether it's seasonal flight season or the non-flight season. <clears throat> So the real risk is, when Elise was talking about the life cycle of EAB, um, when it's in the wood, when the larva is in the wood, uh, it's not as risky to move it because it's contained in the wood. But when it's flight time, when, when, they, when they hatch out, that's when it's risky to move the wood because they could, you could move it and they, they think the concrete New Hampshire may have been a firewood moving and it came out of the back of a pickup truck. That's, it could fly out and just infest a tree from there. And I don't think I said the flight season is May 1 to September 30th. Okay. And the, and reality is that's the federal quarantine flight season. We think actually in Vermont it's more like mid-June to early September. And it's based on the growing de degree days. And so that's it's a, it's a little bit smaller window, but we're still going with the May 1 to September 30th. Um there is one thing that you should be aware of, that we are not under uh, a state, like a county quarantine, or we're in the federal quarantine, and move, wood can move throughout Vermont. There is a law on the books on, that agriculture oversees that says you cannot move a plant pest, uh, and ag can enforce that. Now they're saying if you are following the slow the spread recommendations, no problem. But if you are intentionally moving visibly infested wood, you can see the galleries, you know you have EAB, and you're not following the recommendations, you're moving infested firewood during the summer months, they can do something about it. Now I don't, they haven't said what they would do, but they can enforce that um, <laughs> law. So the takeaway from slow the spread is, is to keep it local. We want to, wood, where some wood can move within that infested area. Uh, if you are going to be thinking about moving wood out of the infested area, you would want to, you know, timing matters because you can do a lot more in the winter time than you can do uh, during the flight season. And for municipalities and working with arborists and utilities, Chipping and grinding is considered a treatment. So that is considered that there's no little risk if it's been chipped uh, or, or it was grind, ground that you can still have live EAB after that. Now Elise is going to go into some other utilization options, how to use wood locally, but this is sort of the slow the spread recommendations of trying not to move infested wood out of the infested area and spread it. 
think that was my last one. Yeah. And you all have the four um, slowly spread recommendation sheets in your packet. So those are that. Um, we'll give more information on everything Danny just talked about. Um, so moving into municipal planning, planning for EAB. Um, the kind of three points I want to start with are that one, ash trees play an important role uh, as street and park trees in many communities of Vermont, along rural roads in many communities in Vermont, and in our public forested land like our town forests. So just understanding that and appreciating that fact up front that it's a valuable tree in the landscape. Um, when we lose it from the landscape, there will be a gap, um, and that uh, that the, the idea that we should just go and cut all of our ash trees down is not something I'm personally comfortable saying that we should do. Um, the second point is that municipalities have a duty of care uh, to ensure public safety. So that's, that, that, is, that is true. So trees along the right of way that could fall and harm someone or property um, those need to be managed. So municipalities need to manage the impacts of EAB. You have to do something. And then the third piece, which I know is very unpopular, is that municipalities, for the most part, will bear the responsibility and the costs for that management. <coughs> FEMA is not coming in and paying for the removal of all of your trees. This, this pest is widely considered to be a slow-moving natural disaster that is the most expensive forest pests in the history of our country, and largely, most of those costs are being borne by municipalities and private landowners. Um, I really like this quote uh, that I just, there's a, on our website we have a couple of examples of EAB plans, and I just read one yesterday from Onondaga, Onondaga County, New York, which is Onondaga. really Onondaga. 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 Syracuse. Onondaga. Syracuse. From Syracuse. Um, they have a pretty comprehensive plan um, that I think is worth a read through if you're interested in kind of a variety of formats of plans. But I just like this, this quote. They said, the management of ash trees should adhere to two goals. One, ensuring public safety, and two, retaining some of the ecological and social benefits that ash trees uh -huh. provide. Um, that's a terrible photo that I put that up there. It's so grainy. Um, so as far as, as management strategies for, you, for our municipality, what, I, what I'm going to present is, is basically a spectrum. So very much understanding that every town is going to have a different approach to EAB and that we can't prescribe one method that you're going to be able to deal with this, this pest. There are so many variables. The first and foremost being uh, vulnerability to EAB. So if you're a town that has a lot of ash on your, in your right-of-ways in your public sp spaces, you are much more vulnerable and are going to be impacted much more than a town that has not a lot of ash to deal with. So that's one variable. Um, second is existing budget for tree care, for tree removals. I know that a lot of towns have zero dollars on, in their budgets for tree. And I know that a lot of towns, tree care or tree is just um, circle or like um, wrapped in public works, general public works or roads crew budget every year. So um, another variable might be the public will. So are there people in town that are uh, passionate about saving some of these trees? Are they passionate about making sure that there's an inventory? Or is there someone that's willing to um, take charge and write a plan and make sure that this left board knows about this issue? Um, is there a public will to treat some trees, which we'll talk about? Or um, is the public perception of chemical treatment of trees in your town not favorable? And that's something that you want to engage in. So, these are just some examples of the variables that we just can't say this is what you should do. We can consider all of these things in, in the planning process. Um, on one end of the spectrum, so these are just, so these three kind of photos are, are just what they're showing is that, you know, in Burlington, they're starting to do some interplanting. So they have some neighborhoods that are highly, pretty much monoculture ash, green ash. 
Um, so they're not taking any of those trees down right now. What they're doing is finding gaps and they're planting new trees in between so that when EAB comes through, they lose those trees, there's something to take over. Um, this is a photo of systemic trunk injection, which I will talk about. That is a strategy for management for EAB. Um, and then this is a photo outside of Concord, New Hampshire, along a rural road where nothing was being done. Um, and these trees, these ash trees are all dead along the road. Um, yeah. So that photo on the right is, um, so we've been doing inventory in, in our town. And so here you've got a power line on one side and, um, and not on the other side. Yeah. And so I, I, you know, we've been inventorying the ones that are not on the side of the power line and assuming that the utilities are going to be dealing with that. Mm -hmm. But I, I just want to... Sure, I have a slide about utilities, okay. um, but I'll, you know, just addressing that now. We met with um, all of our ut electric utilities in May, um, and they, they are all very aware of this. They all have plans either in development or in place. GMP will be dealing with 11,000 miles of road, um, and they will be focusing on uh, the areas that are confirmed. So. Um, will not be, they would like to be ahead of the pest, but they will be um, responding to areas where it is, and they will manage within the utility right away. I, I had originally been talking with towns and saying you don't have to inventory both sides if the utility is going to take care of that utility right of way, and uh, our meeting in Arlington. Yeah, <coughs> if I say yeah. a few things too, because yes. reality is the municipality and utility both have the right to manage in <coughs> that right of way. Uh, the utility may be behind your desire. Um, yeah. That's just the reality because they have a lot to handle and they are usually on a rotation every five years, sometimes even a little bit longer. Um, and so they may have been there two years ago, there were no signs, and three, another two years down the road, these trees are dead. Um, they're not always able to come back right away. So uh, many utilities are planning, but they haven't shared with us what their plan is yet. And uh, that I've asked them, I even, I put a call out to them this week, but of course they're a little busy this week with that, this now. Uh, to, what do you want me to be telling, uh, what do you want us to be telling communities? And that they have also have a big financial pressure on them to, to deal with this. And, and they're also considering, um, they, they pr prefer to remove them preemptively because they have an issue with contractors who do not want to climb trees that are infested with EAB. Um, and the way that we've heard that trees fail or, uh, in the removal, that it's three times more to remove a dead tree. So they'd like to be ahead of it. I don't know if they're always going to be ahead of it. So you can actually, if you want to be more proactive and remove the risk, you can also manage those trees in the right way. What I will say is that make sure you have people that have the right certification to do it. Because anytime you're within 10 feet, of a utility line, you need to have certain certifications because it is dangerous. Um, that's why it'd be ideal if utility companies come in with their professional um, contractors that they bring in. Now that's, you know, we're talking the bigger GMP, Washington Electric, uh, Vermont Electric Co-op, Vel Velco, some of the smaller municipalities have, we municipal uh, utility companies we have not engaged with. I, have, I did go to the emergency management meeting well, we had an emergency preparedness planning session with most utilities, so they are aware of it, but I think they're very much in a planning phase and trying to get the resources they're going to need. How are um, utility right-of-ways determined? Is there a fixed width or it, like uh, it with town roads, or does it vary? I think it varies. It, yeah. it varies I mean, I with think the size of the line. Mm -hmm. right. Size of the lines, and if it's, it's I, mean, I've just I wonder if we can get that for you though. Yeah, that's uh, Bonnie, do you know if we can get utility right away with you might based on the size of the line, it might not be exact. I'm going to take that back because, yeah, that's, that's good. That'd be really helpful. Yeah, Rick, the right of way often varies from what they're actually controlling now, too. Sometimes they're most often they're, they're managing a narrower portion of what they actually have, right? Right, right yeah. And I wonder if they'll go out and remove danger trees too. I mean, sometimes they'll do that. 
Um, there, we've heard from other states that some utilities weren't very active at all, but they pay for it down the road. And, that, and you know, reliable power, they're going to get a lot of calls, and so they're going to want to mitigate it. And we're also in a heavily, you know, the Midwest wasn't as heavily uh, ash dominated like uh, like we're dealing with on here. The rural roads. Yeah, on the rural yeah. roads. Yeah. Were sure. there any examples in the Midwest of any like partnerships between municipalities and utilities to maybe be a little more proactive? Yes. If there could be money from both sides. Is there any examples of that? Yeah. Well, we did bring National Grid in uh, from New York because they are very have, are being very proactive uh, and. They are working with municipalities, mostly to raise awareness, um, and maybe when they're in that community talking about it. But uh, right now, what I'm hearing from like GMP and stuff, we can't handle all the calls that are coming in. We're working on it, and when I have our message, we'll, we'll let you know what it is. Uh, so they're not going to be able to respond when you say, that tree's down, come do it, we're ready. They're, they're planning 11,000 miles of line and trying to put it into their rotation. And they're, and they're really being, I have to say, really are trying to help slow the spread, too, um, which they're on board with that. Jory, I think well, my question was a follow-up to that, like really how receptive power companies might be to calls, especially from towns that know they're infested. Is there hope that you call them and bug them and ask for faster action? or? We, we asked, uh, when we met, we asked if they wanted towns to share their inventory data, for example, and they said, no, not right now. And they're doing, um, GMP did do an inventory, and they estimate, estimate that there's about 10% ash along their lines. Um, but, they're, but they're updating that inventory to be more realistic now that they realize that they're going to have to really manage these. Um, and I think that some towns could point the company to the roads like with higher ash but it's certainly not a uniform right yeah right yeah. We're, we're trying to make that that dialogue right now they're they're in a very similar situation to to you they have to get a budget they got it they got to do a plan they got to get a budget to, to so they're you know they got they may have to go to the public utilities commission they may have you know that it's it's they know for them it's going to be huge financial pressure and new and resources are going to, need to come in. I wish I could say more. <laughs> this isn't a question, it's just an observation, which is that it seems to me that there's more act along roads and right of ways. I mean, it's an intermediate tolerant tree yeah. and it, compared to in the forest. So yeah. It's huge. Our five just our five percent estimate might be really low compared right, to for the to right the with. forested. Yeah, and that's yeah, what and they higher. came out with ten percent. Um, yeah. yeah. Very good point. Um, all right, so just to kind of give you the, the bookends in the middle of that spectrum that I mentioned about management is that on, on the one end, um, you know, one strategy is to be highly proactive. So this would entail um, preemptively removing trees before EB arrives, and I'm, I'm not condoning that, I'm just saying this is a strategy that some municipalities have taken across the 35 states, um, replacing trees, starting off the bat, um, essentially uh, maybe doing some insecticide treatments of trees that, high value trees that they want to save with a really high upfront cost. So being way ahead, um, you know, figuring out your budget, going ahead and start, start mitigating the issue before it's an issue. Um, so this might be appropriate for towns with high budgets, which is, I know in Vermont, not, <laughs> not the reality, but also might be appropriate in, in places that have a really low risk threshold, that don't want to um, be grappling with decisions about um, where to prioritize once trees start dying. In the middle, um, there's this whole swath of space that we're calling the selective management spectrum. So, Picking strategies um, based on your desired time frame that you want to maybe, it, the goal here is really to spread cost out over time. So picking strategies uh, based on a time frame, picking strategies based on target areas, so knowing where your ash concentrations are, um, knowing how you want to prioritize. And some of the strategies in here um, including include a lot of monitoring 
And I'm going to talk about slowing ash mortality, which is the cool acronym SLAM, slow ash mortality. Um, so, so you're monitoring your population, you're understanding um, where you are on that curve of population. Um, you might be starting to do some removals of dead, tr dead and poor and only fair ash trees. Now, understanding that you'll be removing trees over a, a, a chunk of time, number of years. Um, maybe you're doing replacements, maybe you're doing interplanting like Burlington. Um, maybe you're doing some insecticide treatment of high value trees. Maybe you're doing insecticide treatment of trees just as a gap stop. So um, to delay the death of those trees for a couple years and knowing that you will not continue those treatments over time, but to kind of slow down that death curve. Um, you're being strategic about your zones, about, your pl about where you're putting your energy, um, and again, that, that the real goal here is to spread costs out over time. And I think this is where um, most of our communities that are doing planning in Vermont for EAB are going to be falling somewhere in here, hopefully. The third, uh, on the other end of that spectrum, is the, what we're calling reactive or delayed management. And this is, you know, people have called it the do nothing approach, but it's really not do nothing because you will have to do something. But you're, in this case, you're really just kind of letting, and maybe you know where all of your ash trees are, but you're really just kind of letting them die and then dealing with them as they die. Um, this, it's, it's just important, uh, the message to take back to your select boards when you're talking about this is that this, the, the do nothing delayed reactive approach is very likely the most expensive approach in the long run. Um, as Danny mentioned, the tree ash, once they die from EAB, they, um, they do not die with dignity. They fall apart really fast. Um, they snap at the base. Um, the large tree care companies that you might contract to do removals will not climb trees in areas where we know EAB is. Um, if, if a certain amount of the canopy is gone, they will not climb trees in the winter. They need to bring their cranes in. It can be up to three times more expensive to remove trees that are dying and dead from EAB than um, if you catch it earlier and remove the trees when they're still alive. Um, it's also much more dangerous. Um, and I, kind of my fear here is that for a lot of towns, um, the default is just to say, oh, our road crew will just deal with these trees as they as they die, and um, they're, they're they again they, they break apart and they fall apart a lot differently than other trees. So whereas you have an, an elm tree that dies from Dutch elm can stand for a number of years on the roadside and be structurally pretty okay, uh, within a couple years um, the ash will start to break apart. Um, so you know, that being said, we, we have actually put in a proposal, a grant proposal to develop, hopefully we get it with the Forest Service, do it, hopefully. Um, yeah, to, to develop kind of a game of logging training for road crews, for municipal road crews, so that we're, we're able to communicate this um, and to help towns understand how to safely deal with these trees along the rural roadsides as, they, as they're declining and once they're infested. Yeah. So along the lines of making the argument, you said that it can cost up to three times more to remove a dead tree. Is that a dead emerald ash borer tree? Or if that, if so, then can you compare that to a different dead kind of dead tree? What what we're hearing is when they fall, they shatter. They shatter. So there's a, just a lot more cleanup involved, and because they are so brittle, your typical techniques that you do to remove, because you can't climb them your rigging techniques to take it down, uh, they fall under their own weight. So it is much more labor intensive and you have to use equipment to get in there. So they are finding EV infested trees are more expensive to take down. Um, now, especially if you think about real urban areas. But are you asking like, would you be able to look at a tree, a dead tree and say that died from EAB versus? No, I mean, so we, some of the conversation I'm hearing in our town is, well, you know, we have dead trees now and we just deal with them when they die. So, you know, if say like Dutch Elm, which I think some of our staff probably <laughs> might have seen, but anyway, if that's like a, it's twice as expensive and this is three, that sort of thing, like how would you compare it to taking? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that, so the, the rigging piece is a, so you can't, you know, sometimes you when they're- number? I, I have some, I have some budget numbers. I don't have, I don't have specifics about dead tree costing 
X amount other than the three times, but I do have I do have a slide with some budget numbers that we'll get to in just a couple minutes. Just to make sure I've got yes. the right question. Yes. So it costs three times as much to, to take down a dead emerald ash or ash. Yes. After it's dead compared to when it's alive. Yes. And and we, what does it cost to take down a dead elm tree after it's dead compared to when an elm tree is alive? <laughs> Rick, Rick, Rick is here. Sorry. Right. So, um, <laughs> we've done a lot of archives over the years, and they look at it uh, before ash borer as dead or living. And it's pretty easy to look at a dead tree and, and say, hey, that's you know, a lot that we don't know what's going on. Living tree, you can assess that a little more easily. So a dead tree right off the bat is going to cost more. There's right. a lot more work involved, a right. lot more equipment. So easily two times more than a living tree. Okay. Throw an ash borer, it's even more complex. That goes three times. Okay. And that's I think a big easy. part of that is, again, in the cleanup. Because when, when you cut a limb off and drop it to the ground with an elm or something, you can pick it up, throw it in the chipper. With the ash, what we're hearing is the limb comes down, hits the ground, and shatters. So you're spending a lot more time, whoever's doing that work is spending a lot more time actually gathering up all the pieces mm -hmm. and sticking them into the chipper. And, and this, is a, this is a generalization because yes. we don't know the long story yet. I mean, that's just the reality. We, we're not, we, have, we don't know how it's going to really play out here. Yep. This is what we're hearing from experiences in other states, yep. and I, and also when you're removing, you know, depends on if there's infrastructure in the way. If you can just drop it, or you have to take it down because you have a, a house or a target there that you want to make sure that you doesn't hit. So there's there's a lot that plays into removal. Is it? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I do, and we will get. I do have estimates of general costs from talking to arborists that I'll get to in just a minute. Was there one other? Yeah. Right. Some of this has to do with the grain pattern. It, it's it's one of those trees when you're felling it, it just about splits itself. So right. for firewood, it's, it's great. Perfect. But uh, for what we're talking about with safety of moving, I'm not that much. Yeah. yeah. And it's just because it's cutting off the moisture, it's just, that's where it's getting so brittle. Yeah. I wanted to just oh, Paul. Paul. Yeah. That with ash, it's a it is a readily splitting wood, and generally when we look at trees, <clears throat> you know, you you can tell how fast the tree is rotting by how fast the twigs drop, drop off, off yeah. you know, and you can tell after a year or two years or three years or whatever. Something like elm is a very tough mm -hmm. and stringy wood, you know, with interlocked grain and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they can stand for quite a while, uh, you know, and you still <laughs> can fell them and um, right. hold together. Yep. And so it's very much a, a factor of the species of wood uh, and your experience with them. Right. And so something like dealing with game of logging yeah. is well worth it because yeah. that's all about uh, Absolutely. Know, knowing your species and experience with them and yeah. with what happens with trees that have certain growth patterns, mm -hmm. uh, which affect yeah. all of this. Well, hopefully we'll get that funding. It's four, big, big, big bucks from the Forest Service, so. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to mention this, I just added this slide today, and, and I, John, you might want to talk about it when, when you talk about the <coughs> leader's approach, but this, um, this slam, slow ash mortality, it's a kind of a technique or an approach that, that um, you can take to try to monitor and it, limit the, the population boom of EAB once you have an infestation. So there's just there's just a couple strategies like um, establishing these trap trees, or actually I heard the other day they're referred to as sentinel trees. Mm -hmm. So you're essentially sacrificing a tree by girdling it, which stresses the tree out and it attracts the EAB. They, it's, it's easier food for them, they'll come flocking. Um, they get inside of the tree and then um, you harvest the tree while, over the winter when the, the larvae are inside. Um, and then you peel the bark to, to monitor and then you get rid of the wood, kill all the EV in it. So that, that is um, establishing trap trees. It's something that um, we've heard a lot of interest in in recent weeks. People on their own property um, um, and other municipalities are interested in establishing. This is something that forest pest protectors might be called upon to, to do or might want to coordinate. Jeff? When you say you kill the um, EAB, <coughs> what's the method of killing it? Oh, you, um, you burn the wood, you chip the wood. Yeah. 
get rid of them. Yeah. That suggests the girdling technique suggests that EAP is a secondary insect attacking stress trees. Yes. They are more attracted to stress trees. In a healthy forest? It's, it's, or, uh, in municipal, uh, you're, you're talking about municipal. Yes. Well, but, but there, I mean, you might establish this on, you know, we had a landowner in, down in Arlington who was planning on doing this on his, on his, oh, in his woodlot. Hmm. They, but they, they love healthy trees too. Yeah. So they are attracted to the pheromone of that, of the stress. So it's, they're not just going after stress trees, but they will be attracted to that. Joanne. And I've also read that where the emerald ash borer is native, the, the tree, it does attract stress trees in general, and the healthy trees have a resistance. Um, whereas here, where the insect is not native, none of our trees have, have resistance. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so there's not a, as large a difference between them attacking a healthy or, or stress tree. Just, I mean, um, in my experience, uh, I have a stand of uh, about five trees, and uh, uh, two of them are now completely dead. Um, and Strangely, the most stressed tree seems unaffected. It's the one that's unaffected. It's weird. I don't think really understand. I have no answer for it. No, 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 I'm just, I'm just <laughs> saying it's a strange. Yes. You'll find trees, and some trees that seem also are healthy and unaffected also. Mm -hmm. Strange. Well, this is a strategy that has been implemented, and um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have a number of how effective it has been, and but I think you know as. Um, Another piece of this is, is the being able to kind of monitor where your population level is. So, you know, doing the peeling and understanding, okay, we tracked this tree, we found X amount of EAB, um, we know it's, it's get, more than last year, so, or more than three years ago, so understanding where your population level is. Um, there, another, another strategy in, within SLAM is kind of selectively harvesting larger diameter trees in, a, in an area so that you're essentially removing a, some percentage of the available phloem and then utilizing that wood, so building something out of it that's, yeah. Can we call it hydrating? <laughs> hydrating? Hydrating. 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 <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, so there, there are some papers about this if you're more interested in learning about SLAM. Um, I just wanted to mention it. Um, in any any kind of strategy, management strategy, you're going to take, the, the very first and most important piece to start with is understanding your vulnerability. So that means having some kind of an inventory of your public ash trees. So, um, you know, I always say you can't manage, but you don't know you have. So you, you could find, like Berry City, you have 15 total ash trees to deal with, and that it's really not going to be within the public realm that big of a deal for your community. Or you could find like Randolph that you have estimated 6,000 trees along your back roads. So um, getting that inventory, having some type of survey is a great first step. Um, it's a great way to get people energized and engaged in uh, EAB planning at the local level. Give people something to do. Go count ash trees. Uh, and we can really help you start. Um, we have three tool. We have a website that's dedicated to ash inventory and we have Three t we're calling tiers of inventory. So the first is really the lowest commitment level, like the, if you have very low capacity to do an inventory. Um, we have a couple of examples of tally sheets. So this would, uh, and, and kind of a protocol to follow if you want to do like a driving ash, rural road ash tally. You could pick 10% of your roads. You could pick the you know, 10 miles of the most heavily trafficked roads in town. Um, just getting a general sense of how many trees in each size class you're seeing. Um, along your road. So then you can estimate what your total vulnerability is. The second tier is, is a new tool that we have. It's called the Rural Roadside Ash Inventory Tool. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it other than to say we have a couple communities that we've trained and are using the tool now. It uses an ArcGIS collector app called Col ArcGIS Esri <laughs> app called Collector which you um, download and use on a smart device that has um, high GPS capacity. So iPad Airs, we have 12 of them. Um, we can loan them to towns to use to collect inventory data. You're essentially stopping at either every tree or maybe some designated protocol like every half mile or whatever, and you're plotting a feature that's telling you how many trees are within 
ash trees are within that area. So it's either you know single tree or hey, we went, we're stopping every half mile and just counting the number of trees within a half mile or plotting them. So um, we have a protocol for this. We have a couple of videos on our website that just kind of walk you through what it looks like to use. So if you're interested in exploring what that looks like, um, the idea with this is that that um, you can just use it. We don't have to. We, you don't have to hire us to come. Um, it, we, I, I can do a training and then get you set up to be able to go out and collect the data on your own. Uh, and then the third tier is our street tree inventory tool. So that's uh, really appropriate for like more populated. If you want to stop and look at every single tree, spend five minutes at each tree, looking at all different kinds of if it needs pruning, if it has signs and symptoms whatsoever. So um, not really appropriate for rural roadsides, but if you have those more downtown areas, um, that's the tier three high, um, high, most work involved. And we don't moonlight, so we, we can't hire us, but you can't, sorry, 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 you can't hire us, yeah. You, we would, yeah, you can't hire us. Um, we already talked about utilities, so I'm gonna skip this slide. But again, just reiterating what oh. Danny's hearing was hearing. Yeah, the, I think the last piece that we heard from utilities, and this may happen um, when with road crews too, they're leaving the wood. In our efforts to slow the spread and not move potentially infested wood from the infested area outside, we are hearing from utilities they like to leave the wood on site for the landowner, and that a lot of times. There's these wood fairies <laughs> at, that come and move the wood. So we've talked to them, put signage up, what they can do to just minimize that movement first in our efforts to slow spread. That's the wood fairies. That is the only PG version or G version of wood fairies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you just talk about um, the, the um, protocol where wood can be moved within the quarantine area and yet you're saying it can't be moved? I don't understand. So yeah, so they that would, moving out from the infested area, people could pick it up right. and move it to outside the infested area. You know, so if they, you have a you know you have a trunk on the ground, they cut it up for firewood and they're gonna drive twenty miles away and that's okay. gonna be outside the infested area. Okay. So that's so not allowed. That's well, not allowed. Yeah. It's okay. it's not rec it's well, it's not recommended. It's not recommended. Yeah, okay. not recommended. There is no enforcement. No. But the quarantine is saying that there are certain things that can happen within that the, quarantine. The quarantine is the federal quarantine, okay. and our entire state is within the federal right. quarantine. Right. So you can move anything around the entire state of Vermont and still be within the quarantine. Well, there, there were signs, however, I, I thought I saw a sign that, that said don't move fire. And that was our effort to slow the spread. Right. But that's, so you're saying that's not enforceable. That's it's, not, it's our recommendations. You, there are, you know. Okay. Yeah, so that's the slow. The slow the spread recommendations. The slam. Yes. Part of the slam movement is to keep it local. Yeah. Essentially. Okay. So. I have a question. I want to go back to your wood fairies. We call them wood weasels. But again, um, my understanding is that for, for municipalities, when they cut a tree in the right of way, they do leave it for the landowner because that tree belongs to the landowner. Right. Mm -hmm. So what kind of responsibility, what kind of outreach are you giving to landowners saying, hey, when the town comes and cuts a tree and leaves it in your ditch, it's your tree. I, I you know. Yeah, so I mean, that's like the wood fairies right. to take it away. Right. Yeah, that's some consideration in your planning effort when you're, how you plan on dealing with that. Yep. Um, because it doesn't seem like they're if they're going to use it, you know, one of the, you know, we've heard from some communities where they're thinking about if they are removing ash trees that they're going to take it to a place and and cut up for firewood and give and give it out to, to residents. So and can they do that? That's my question: is can they do that, or do they are they required to leave it for the landowner? My understanding is that the leaving it for the landowner is by and large a courtesy that municipalities do okay. for. Um, for landowners, so in, in in urban downtowns, they certainly are not leaving right. 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 the wood. Right. Right. Um, right. So I, I don't. I'm not aware of a statutory, okay. any kind of policy that says you must leave the no, wood. No, it's a PR. It's a PR. Right. So because the, the the municipality has the management rights, but the reality is the landowner owns the tree. So right. that's that's why it gets a little it's murky. Yeah, it's a little murky. Yeah. But if you make your public awareness out, this is how we're going to handle it. Yeah. Steve? But you know, as a as a selectman, I mean, I have no interest in 
in processing that wood. I want it on the ground, and, and you know, we're we're talking about preemptively cutting danger dangerous roadside ash. Mm -hmm. I want it on the ground. If it's not infested. Infested, I have no problem with anybody taking it anywhere. And right now, you're out of the infested. If it's not now, it's not a risk, right? If it's not infested, right. it's, it's not a risk, right? right? right. And then it, you could have uh, PR in your community that says, you know, come take the wood and use it in your home. You know, like it, just yeah. we don't want it leaving the area. Yeah. If you're in, Ginny, I always thought that the wood it wasn't a courtesy that the town left it. it the wood belongs to them. I think it's statutory. I don't yeah. think it's. I don't know so of a. I, I don't know about this. Yeah, I, always that's a great thing for us to go back. Yeah, because I know. I mean, they have the magic right, but they own the wood, and I and I think it's more. You know, you have a dialogue. What's there's also a standard of practice that happens in communities. Yeah. It's certainly not in the in the tree warden statutes. It's that is not something that's that's laid out in the in the Vermont tree warden statutes, and that's you probably know the answer to that. Yes, we we will take that back. Yeah, well, and you know they own it. It's just what's 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 happening, right? And, yeah. and I think a lot of times they just get removed, uh, and sometimes they leave it because it's easier, or they yeah, and they know the landowner wants it. <coughs> Are there situations presently where <coughs> wood like that is actually being? utilized in schools or municipal buildings as chipped wood because a lot of these buildings are being heated. I, I was going to ask that because we have a wood chip plant that our needs a school in town. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, we had exactly the same questions if it was legal to chip it, take it there, or if it's the landowners. We also talked about the tree fairies coming, taking the cut mm -hmm. of wood on the ground and taking it outside the area and not being a big risk. It's certainly worth the dialogue because depending on what the the size of the chips and what the requirements are for the system um, and how they receive their chips, uh, so I think it would be a good dialogue to have whether there could be a partnership in this. I know the trees we took down in, at National Life got used in National Life. Uh, yeah, but then when we were in Bennington, Bennington College, it's uses chips and he was talking about they have to be very specific yeah, dimensions, dimensions and, and no one has locally has that um, so we're not going to take the wood somewhere else chip it and come back do they have the capacity to to grind it or you know to, to, i think there's it's it could certainly be, it worth could be a great and uh, like the composting you know out of we, we may find opportunities that arise locally that um well, you have to make the opportunity. Make the opportunity. What, it, what it probably has to happen is that you have to get with the people who are doing the chipping yeah, and right. say, listen, this is what needs to happen so that we can deal with this problem. Right. And right. if we have to make a deal with you to have the right equipment <laughs> so that this can work and yeah. you can make chips when you're within a certain radius of this town and and we get are these chips here or get them to the state of Vermont facility in Montpelier or whatever these is, places are spread all that's around the state too. we just need to make things happen so that one hand washes the other otherwise this whole problem is going to bury us yeah one of the, I'll just you know this we're responding as well we've been planning for a long time but the planning was mostly in detection and now we're trying to figure it out as well sure. i had a meeting this week with the uh, with composters association of composters of vermont and we've uh, done a survey of which facilities will actually take the chips because they need carbon and it's, it's a source so eventually i think probably in a new year you'll be able to access a list of where chips can go but it's going to need to be some will chip some need to take chips too and we're also working with, for, for Chitin Solid Waste, we are also working with DEC and identifying which facilities will accept wood and treat them <coughs> according to our slow to spread recommendations. So we're, we are working on that um, from our end, um, but there's probably a lot, a lot of local opportunities I would expect as well. Yeah. Chris, what's the status of towns working on a, their own Specific or regional disposal area, like ash, ash disposal area. It's it's certainly part of our you know, our planning worksheet. It's something to think about. Has anyone tried it or started it? 
third one? You can ask the group here. Yeah, the, for the plans that I've read, there are recommended places in town. Like, you know, here are some ideas about where we might have a disposal yard, but um, we're again at a place where I don't, a lot of these plans have just been accepted or being reviewed by select boards and haven't. Um, haven't necessarily been accepted. So I don't, I don't know of any towns that have an established yard yet. So speaking of uh, missing opportunities, uh, we're just trying to figure this out. We don't have an answer to it. But we, we've had a long ways site for several years that takes any long ways and turn it into compost and rather mm -hmm. taking away as much for free. So, you know, it, and then our public works crew goes in and chips wood that's there. I mean, we're gonna have to do some management and we put some signs up about like, well, if you're taking it for firewood, don't be very town, you know, don't move wood in general, try to get the local. But, you know, there may be a conversation about how to have like a general long way sign. You're also taking act, you know, you're gonna get some ash there, but it could be a resource. I mean, it's been great in our town and apparently other towns are interested in it. Okay. Yeah. Bonnie, did you? Just as you move into the new assumption that you'll just dump all debris in this dump dump, which may shorten its life for when they really need it. You know, so they need to be integrated into your management. Thank you. Do you have something right? I'm uh, just curious as to whether or not you guys saw what other towns have been doing that have had this infestation like towns in the Midwest. How are they disposing of these troops? Is there, is there kind of good analysis of that? What, what's worked? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, we, we're trying to get as much information as we can and it's interesting when you talk to other states like it's like oh we've dealt with this already and they are obviously finding that um, disposal sites are not as big of a deal as they were at, at when they that they thought they were going to be that the wood seems to be getting managed uh, that the that the, it was arborist taking it down or chipping it or uh, it doesn't seem to be as big of, of a need as they expected it to be and I think some of the you know more urban areas um, are are doing utilization projects that are maybe more um, a little scaled up. So, so actually making furniture out of the wood, or like putting flooring in, or paneling for a new library, or building benches, um, things like that, that are coming out of another opportunity that's coming out. And a lot of you know we're talking about these disposal sites because we're trying to slow the spread. You know, and I think in some of those other areas in the Midwest, they may have already been like, well, it's here, that they're not as much as concerned about slowing the spread as, as we are now at this point. Yeah. Um, so moving, moving along to budgeting. Um, so I have some very rough estimates, and I've been working uh, quite a while on a, on a spreadsheet that's going to be on our website that has um, this information and some caveats to this information. I've, been calling local arborists that are reputable in Vermont. Um, some of this information is based on other other states. Um, this this figure, the eighteen dollars and thirty three cents per diameter inch for removal, is from the Forest Service. An estimate. Um, actually, this should come down. I, I have talked to some 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 towns have gotten quotes that are as low as one hundred and fifty per tree for removal. It depends on the size of the trees. Depends on if they're clustered in one neighborhood or if they're kind of scattered all over. It depends on um, other infrastructure. There's a lot of variables here, but the, uh, between $150 and 3500 <laughs> to remove a tree, I think that 3500 again, is trees in hard places that are really big. Um, stump grinding is some, if you're going to do replacement where the tree was planted, um, this, is, this is, again, probably not applicable to our rural roadsides. I don't expect there'll be a lot of replacement trees planted, but in your villages and your <laughs> downtown's public spaces, um, some grinding allows you to be able to put a tree back in the ground. Um, it's not necessary to, um, you don't have to do stump grinding, but you know, 125 to 250 a tree for replacements, um, depending on if you have volunteers doing the plantings, if you're growing them in your own nursery, like Montpelier, um, anywhere from 100 to 600 if you're having someone come in and, and do those tree plantings. And then insecticide treatment, um, <clears throat> we could talk about this at length probably, but 
The range I'm comfortable giving is between three and twelve dollars per diameter inch. So if a ten inch diameter ash tree, it would be around one hundred and twenty ish dollars to treat that tree. Um, the, th the lower end of this is if you have someone on your town staff that is a certified pesticide applicator and could do that application themselves versus hiring an arborist to do the, 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 the insecticide application. Um, we, you you ha all have a sheet in your packet that is uh, our recommend the products that the state of Vermont is recommending if you do decide to go with an insecticide treatment. There are two products. Emamectin, benzoate, and azadiractin. These are both in the non-neonicotinoid class of pesticides, which means they are the non-pollinator impacting. There are many other products out there. Um, there are products that homeowners can buy on Amazon for EAV. We do not want that happening. <laughs> I don't want that happening in Vermont. So being really clear um, with your residents, having information available, you know, talking with local arborist companies, um, having information up on your website, these are reputable people that can do insecticide treatment if you'd like to do that. I really recommend that. Um, we've heard from other states that um, predatory companies may come in to Vermont and uh, prey on the fear of particularly elderly residents and tell them they need to have all their trees treated and charge them astronomical prices. So. Having you know this information up on our website and having some vetted companies coming from your local, you guys, your, your local conservation commissioner from your town, um, I think makes a lot of sense. We've already had a resident in Charlotte that paid fourteen hundred dollars to have three box elder trees treated oh. for a <laughs> oh, oh. So um, it will happen here, unfortunately. Um, so doing what we can do just to, to make sure we're putting out the right information. Uh, the, two, the two treatments that we're recommending are both systemic trunk injections, which means that they are um, injected into, directly into the base of the trunk of the tree in the springtime. They both are treatments that would happen every other year in perpetuity. So um, will happen, have to happen at least for 20 years, because that's all the example of, you know, all the experience that we have in the Midwest is we've only got 20 years of experience, really. You, uh, you may you maybe can stretch it out when the population is dropped to, to three, three years. years but. Yeah, uh, but that being said, very effective. Uh, they are very effective. Um, they for high value trees in good condition. Um, if they if those trees are providing benefit, are they if they have historic value, if they're valued by your town, your community, um, it it can be as economic as as economical to treat those trees as it would be to remove and replace them. So it's just important to recognize that it's not always just going to be cheaper to just remove everything. You could actually find that it's over the long term, provided you're understanding the benefits that those trees are providing back to your community. And we do have on our, on our website um, a frequently asked question of the side, side uh, effects of the pesticides. Because there's a lot of questions of what will happen to woodpeckers, what happens to pollinators. And there's an excellent frequently asked questions that goes through th that for the pesticides that we're recommending. And I, and I recommend if you are going, you, sh you should be aware of those potential side effects. And um, it, yeah. just sharing that it's out there and it's really good advice, uh, mm -hmm. information. There, you know, there are a couple communities. Uh, Charlotte is an example of a town. They have a lot of large ash on private property. Their tree warden has uh, kind of put out an open call for anyone in town that's interested in having their trees treated. They're going to put in a bulk order with one vendor, mm -hmm. so um, they'll get a guaranteed price, and you know it's it's being applied by someone um, who's again reputable and vetted by the community. So that's just an example of something that's happening. Uh, I think you know some some towns are choosing to treat some trees, some towns won't be treating any trees. Um, again, you're, there's so many variables. John can talk a little bit about your strategy. Burlington is not going to treat any of their 1,200 trees. Um, and that's mostly because they're so spread out throughout the whole city, they can't afford to treat them all. And they don't um, want to be in a position where they're saying, oh, I value your this neighborhood's ash trees uh, more than I'm valuing this neighborhood's ash trees. Um, they are. Uh, the City Arborist in Burlington has talked with homeowner associations, so that's another strategy. Uh, if you have street, tree, street trees that are green ash, 
in the green belt, um, talking with the homeowners. If, if they want to pay for the treatment, the city could, could coordinate the treatment of those trees. Um, there's a tool called the EAB cost calculator that I, um, once you start wrapping your head around budgets and understanding your tree population, it's a kind of a cool plug and play. You can put in the number of trees you have of different size classes and you can say, I want to spread costs out over 10 years or five years. Um, and you can put in specific numbers about you, the costs you know you're expecting and run it and it'll run different scenarios based on different management approaches. So something to, to look out for or try out. Um, and I'll just end on this last little piece. Considering when it's a good time to ask for funding, um, we're coming up on budget season right now. So um, is, the, is your citizenry aware of EAB? Is this a topic that might get public support this year? Are you going to wait a year to ask for money? Um, I know Middlebury has been um, putting aside about 5000 into every year for the past three years into a reserve fund for EAB. So they're not doing any preemptive tree removals, but they're going to have that money available when they need to start doing that. So maybe that's something you could just ask for a small chunk for a reserve fund right now. Or if you're planning on doing preemptive removals along rural roads next year, maybe this is the time to really ask for some funding. We already talked about wood disposal, disposal and utilization, so um, I'm going to skip this because we're running out of time. Just a little note on public policies. This might be a good time to just look through your town ordinances and policies. Do you have anything on the books that pertains to public trees? Do you have a tree policy or a tree ordinance? Um, if you don't, you default to the Vermont Tree Warden statutes. We have um, a whole public policy page on our website. Those tree warden statutes are up there. Um, there is a section in the tree warden statutes that pertains to infestations that essentially says that if a tree is known to be infested um, and if the commissioner of our agriculture department, what they call it, it used to be called the Department of Agriculture or something, um, deems an infestation um, control measure, then the tree warden can actually require that both public and private trees are treated or controlled. Um, but it says that the municipality will pay for that. So if you don't have anything more specific on the books in your town, uh, it might be just a, a time to think about um, developing some kind of policy around tree care. And private property considerations along that line. Um, what information do you want your town to be providing for its, its homeowners and its landowners? Um, both residential property owners and commercial. So if you have institutions, local businesses that have ash trees on their property, um, what's the information? How do you want those people to be engaged? Um, are you going to provide any support for landowners? And this is, again, something I asked John to mention what Montpelier might consider doing. <coughs> um, yeah, anything on private property? Um, we already talked about ash failing differently, uh, so risking the risk of working in trees killed by EAB. They're not the trees you think they are. Um, and uh, you know, we'll be interested to see in Vermont with our winter storms, ice loads, snow loads, um, that could compound. Um, when I was driving here today, I was like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> this was the type of storm that would have. Um, and I'm going to ask John to come up for just a couple minutes and talk about Montpelier's approach. He's been extremely engaged in EAD planning for ever. Yeah, I'm going right. to pass it to you. All right, I've got a sheet that keeps me on track here so I don't talk too long because, as uh, Elise mentioned, we have been dealing with. Uh, planning for the Emerald Ash Borer since 2013. We wrote a preparedness plan, uh, which included steps to take before the bug got here and then steps to take after the bug arrived. And uh, using that as a basis, we wrote a management plan to deal with the bug now that it's here. And uh, our point in the plan is that we can't stop EAB. Our goal is just to slow it down in Montpelier. That's all we can try to do. 
Uh, so we're using the selective management rather than the delayed or non-management approach. And so how are we going to try to slow it down? Well, um, it comes down to survey, resurvey, resurvey, survey some more. Basically, what we've done is we've gone out and identified uh, all the right-of-way ash trees in, in the city. And we did that uh, with the help of the volunteers and the tree board. And so we identified 450 trees that were in the right-of-way. We did a survey back in 2013 where we identified 550 trees along those streets, but we never tried to delineate exactly which ones were in the right-of-way, so we included some that were probably on private property. So this is a better estimate for what the municipality is responsible for. Um, the plan here then would be to spread the costs out over time, you'd remove 10% uh, of those ash trees over <coughs> each year as they become uh, infested. Uh, some years you may, some initial years, you may not remove the 45 trees, which would be the 10%. You may remove fewer because we don't have the infestation. And then later on, you may have to remove more than the 45. Um, but our other goal is to monitor where the bug is. So we're going to be uh, deploying some of these green, green prism traps. You've seen the purple prism traps. Apparently, we learned that the green prism traps may work a little bit better. And they have a pheromone that you uh, uh, put with them, and it attracts the males, apparently. So if you deploy them in areas that are uh, uh, sus suspected infestations, uh, you can get a handle on whether or not the bug is in that, that area. Um, if detected, we would then utilize some of the trap tree uh, techniques to, to capture the bugs in that area, at least, and slow them down from spreading further. The other concept that wasn't mentioned but is something we're, we're thinking about is, a, is a, uh, the concept of a lethal trap tree where you actually uh, you, you, you create a trap tree but you also inject it with the insecticide so that the bugs are attracted to it and then they're going to perish. And that, tr that tree may last a couple of years longer than your regular trap tree because you need to remove the trap tree once it's infested prior to the adults exiting the next year. So that's, that's a mandatory thing. You'll have to remove that tree. Whereas with a lethal trap tree, it wouldn't necessarily be mandatory that you remove that tree. You could take a look at it, you can monitor it, and then uh, remove it before it becomes hazardous. Yeah? So the process there would be to inject those trees before your girdle. Yes. Right. Yeah. For maybe a year in advance? Well, I, I would say you could, you could inject them, let that insecticide, the systemic insecticide spread, and then, and then girdle. So you'll have to give it a chance to get through roots to, uh, to canopy. So you haven't done that yet? We haven't done it. It's a concept in our plan, OK? I'll get to where we are with our plan in a second, too. Uh, the other thing we, we would, we have already done, at least the people in the Parks Department have done some branch sampling of, of suspect trees looking for evidence of EAB, and we haven't found any to date, so they may have looked at about a dozen trees that we identified during our survey that were suspect trees. But uh, we haven't uh, definitively found the bug in those areas. Okay, so uh, we're also incorporating the protection aspect. We have 15 uh, green ash trees downtown. Some of the, the largest trees downtown are ash tree, green ash trees. We intend to protect those uh, for at least probably a 10-year period while we try to interplant trees, create new tree wells in the concrete, because obviously we're dealing with a lot of concrete down there. So the sidewalks would have to be modified, and we're, that's all part of the plan, and there's actually funding for that. Um, let's see what else here. We have um, some legacy trees in Hubbard Park. If you've been to the old shelter in Hubbard Park, there's a beautiful green ash tree right there. So we're hoping to to, to treat some of those ash trees in, in the park. Most of the ash trees in the park are white ash trees. Uh, I surveyed the trails and I, I identified 600 uh, ash trees, actually located them on, I was a little anal about this, I located them on a map and we have a plan that shows where they all are in the park. Mm -hmm. And uh, of those 600, there's about 170 that are right on the trail or overhang the trail so they would be a hazard when they get infested. So we know where those are 
and the parks folks can deal with those. Most of the trees in the park will not be probably dealt with, except for those few legacy trees. We uh, are hoping to set up a marshalling area, which has been mentioned here earlier, so that infested trees could be brought to the area and processed. You can process them by chipping them. You could process them by removing the outer inch of bark and, uh, and utilizing the wood still. It can be converted into firewood. If it's outside of the flight season, you can have folks pick up the firewood. Uh, we were hoping to provide it to low-income folks, in fact, uh, would be something that we would hope uh, the city council would buy into. Uh, we, we do know about the hazardous trees and, and how expensive they are to remove, so we'd want to be taking down trees once we've identified them as being infested. The other aspect of this is uh, the public. Uh, we have lots of residents, obviously, with ash trees on their property. We did a part of our preparedness plan was to determine or get an estimate as to how many ash trees were on private property. So we took the um, took the grand list basically, and I assigned numbers to all the properties, and then did a random number generator and pulled out 97 properties, and we visited those, and we actually surveyed their their properties for ash trees. And then we extrapolated out based on size of properties, et cetera, and we came up with an estimate of uh, 2,700 ash trees on private property. So that dwarfs the number that we have on the public right away. So that's one way to get people involved is basically say, look, <laughs> you're, you're facing this too. And it's, uh, some of these lots have quite a few ash trees. I know my, per my, my property has at least four. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, that's one way to get people engaged in this, and, and we've, uh, one of our goals is to keep people informed and educated. We have an um, a email site now they can write in and ask questions, EAB Montpelier at montpelier-vt.org. They can send in questions. So when we send out information through Front Porch Forum or the bridge, possibly the Times Argus, they can, they can use that as a uh, place to send in their messages. It comes, all those messages are directly transported to me or John Snell, who's the chair of the, the tree board, and we can get back to those people with some answers or find the answers if we don't know them. In terms of budgeting, here's, here's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, back in 2013, we asked the city council, or we recommended to them that they put aside $20,000 a year to start thinking ahead because we're going to be faced with some expenses. Uh, they didn't see the urgency of that. Uh, we could, and we didn't convince them because the bug wasn't here, and you know it's hard to, hard to explain that it's going to be bad. <laughs> um, so we estimated in the initial year with if, if our management plan was accepted, that the initial cost would be around $231,000 to get things set up. And that includes things including a, a, a reliable bucket truck, which we don't have right now. We have a bucket truck. It's not really safe. Uh, a, uh, we have personnel costs. We would think about having a portable sawmill, uh, chipper, those kinds of things, and setting up a, a marshalling area. This is all wishful thinking in some ways because but it's necessary a marshalling area that would have a chipper and, a, and sawmill and personnel or a contracted uh, sawmill operator to deal with the wood that we're going to be generating basically that's all part of our plan the plan has not been approved yet hasn't been disapproved it's hasn't been acted on and we're going to ask the city council to to do something along those lines the subsequent costs uh, would be around 89,000. That includes the personnel because we, we'd like to have somebody on park staff that dealt with EAB. Uh, we can't rely on volunteers forever. We have to have someone that's actually embedded in the, in, the, in the program. The city council has approved an initial outlay of $20,000 that gets us through this period until they create their budget next year. And this request for money will be part of everybody's request for money in the city budget and there's competing obviously a lots of com competing uh, requests in terms of you know fentanyl and all the things that the, the police deal with and you can see that there's a lot of things that the city has to deal with that can't all be funded so we're hoping we're, we're hopeful but we're not optimistic that we're going to get the amounts that we're asking for but maybe enough to get started anyway i'll take some more questions if there are any 
So what was that based on? Four hundred trees. Four. What, what's your budget based on? The budget is based on is personnel costs, uh, tree removals, uh, pl uh, monitoring. These are right away trees, though. These are right away trees, right? Uh, the four four and four and four. the and the trees that are going to be treating downtown, which aren't that expensive. It's about a thousand bucks a year, because it's every two years, for rent. But there's yeah, if you buy a bucket buck, bucket truck and you and you set up a marshalling area with fencing so that people you don't have the wood fairies showing up and taking your wood all over all over the place. And, and replanting is and replanting and creating new new uh, tree wells, uh, bringing in the su uh, the structural soil that you might need for those areas. Definitely very urban compared to with, we've all talked about rural road sides. Yeah. Is this uh, a, is there any plan to uh, mandate uh, a treatment for a private land or mandate? No, no, no. Uh, the, the tree warden has rights to control infestations or trees that are a danger to the public. So. Uh, that would be up to the tree one to determine whether or not a tree needed to be removed or whatever. But if but it's in, not a danger to the public, and, you know, you've seen out there. We're, we're not mandated, although I've seen a lot of a nice ash on pirate property that I would highly recommend that they would consider treating if they want to keep those trees. There's some beautiful ash trees in Montpelier, green ash trees. So my, uh, my question is similar. It, and so how are you delineating uh, the municipal right away from from private property we're just dealing with in this plan we can only deal with um, with the municipal right away trees yeah however, the private the private trees we're just depending on those folks to be educated and informed and then possibly benefiting from this this uh, um, treatment option that would be available to everybody if we go with a vendor and, and get us yeah, uh, get a better my, price. My question is more basic, and that and, yeah. and it's it's here you are on a street in Montpelier, walking down the street. How do you know what's the right of way? Oh, the because there's a list of every street. Every street. The, every street has a list with its uh, right away from the center line, mm -hmm. and that's what we used. What What about boundary trees? Boundary trees or trees sitting on the line. We've considered anything that sits on the line has to be in the right away. That's what we recommend. But I just yep. What about state right away? How do you deal with that? State roads. State roads. Um, we haven't had to deal with that too much in terms. Gen in general, the state AOT will be trans will, will um, has we a plan. Well, wow, they don't have a plan. They will have a They will, if the, if the state manages the road. In, uh, in Montpelier, though, we do have the backdrop, backdrop to the state house. And there, uh, I know from personal experience that there are a bunch of ash trees up there, and the state is now involved in creating a management plan for that backdrop so that's not a catastrophic uh, scene in a few years when all those ash trees are. are. We, we have reached out to AOT as well, and they do have a team that is working on it. Uh, and I, I know they're actively working on it because they, they just sent me contract language this week on what they're going to put in the contracts for work to slow the spread. And then we're going to be doing a training for district staff on management. So again, early on in their planning, but they, they are they got a lot. They got a lot to deal with. Joanne, have you involved the Montpelier Road crew at all yet? We have indirectly through Jeff Byer, who's our tree warden, and he has more contact with them. We we do uh, deal with public works in Montpelier on a lot of matters, and uh, What's their opinion I haven't I haven't been involved in those discussions. So uh, Jeff and John Snell have been doing most of that. Question. Um, question for you, John, but also just a question in general. Has the, the thought of parasitoids been, uh, and using those, has that been brought up? That we have that in our plan. We don't think we're at that stage yet where uh, the biological controls are at a level where we could count on them to do. I think that's further down, down the road, and plus still be more research on that, so maybe by slowing everything down, we can take advantage of the research that's being done now to, to maybe save our ash trees or some significant number of them in the future, or maybe being able to stop treatment. I don't know. But you know. I, I would keep an eye on it because uh, yeah. the is doing some pretty interesting stuff where they're using a multi pronged approach, insecticides, removing trees, but the parasitoids, and it's, it's working. Okay. And we, you need, we need to, we're not at the levels here to actually sustain the, 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 parasite parasite the population, it is, yeah. It is part of the plan. To, to it's in our plan, yes. And probably more of the, I would say more in our forest, 
yeah. like in Hubbard Park or areas. Yeah. Harvard Park would be an ideal situation, or even the backdrop to the State House, which it, which there's, there's dozens of ash trees back there. Yeah. I don't want to eat up too much more time. I, <laughs> the, you know, everyone has street been, valuables. So um, I apologize for sitting. We, we hope to engage you more during it, but we've been having a dialogue the whole time. Yeah, we, we should learn our lesson, but this is our second one, and we didn't get to it last time either. But um, just to wrap up. Um, again, you, you have all the all of our resources. We're sending you home with them, but they're all available uh, online, including on the VTEAM Basis site. There's actually a um, a whole section on resources for educators and volunteers. So there's some pre-made PowerPoints. They're narrated. There are um, activities for kids. So um, just worth checking out. Again, just things that you can point your public populations to. And I would be remiss to stop without mentioning that we do have some some money, a little tiny bit of money um, available. Our program is, is uh, we have an annual grants program and this year and probably for the foreseeable future will be mostly focused on EAB this year exclusively on EAB planning. So this will be um, $2,000 chunks, so it's not a lot, but it could be significant to get jump started. Um, uh, we have on our website there's information about specific examples of what this might look like but it could be used for you know hiring someone to write a plan working with RPCs to do an inventory buying an iPad so that you can do an inventory and not have to give it back to me at the end of your inventory to have it on hand um, education outreach buying some green traps prison traps so you can do your own monitoring um, the only things that are not going to be covered under this plan, oh, and also replanting. So $2,000 doesn't go very far for trees, but um, it's something, and it could be a great demonstration or a public awareness opportunity. The only things that um, you can't use this money for are tree removals and insecticide treatments. And that second piece, um, it's mostly because the, it's a long-term commitment to do a, a treatment for EAB, so we don't want towns to become reliant on us. Um, that needs to be a commitment that's made by the town. Um, v Team Basives, if you're not signed up for our EAB update listserv, um, it, you basically just put your email address in there, and the, the only time you would ever get an email is if there's an update on, this, on a new detection of EAB, so this is a great way to be aware of where, um, where, where, this, where it's spreading. Right now, there still are press releases that are going out when EAB is found, but at some point, we'll probably reach a point where that's not necessarily going to happen every time a new site is discovered. So this is a way that you can be kept abreast of that. Um, and then we have a newsletter that, if you're not on our tree mail newsletter, it's a great way to be aware of other grant opportunities. And um, we've already talked about this, but just the five takeaways, EAB is here. If you don't treat your trees, 99% of them will, ash trees will succumb to EAB. Um, municipalities are going to have to do something. Um, now is a good time to plan, right now. Um, in order to plan, you have to inventory, so, so that's a great first step. And you can always learn more at our, t our two websites. You want to mention? I want just a few minutes of your time yes. for Central Vermont communities, although the rest of you your communities are all part of a regional planning commission, so they may offer similar services. We do have a grant to help two communities train volunteers on the inventory process and then to help you develop that management plan. So I left some business cards back there, but there are three ways we can assist you. We can help you through that if you're working with volunteers for inventory. This is your training team, by the way. Um, but then we'll follow through with the volunteers. We'll work with you at a town level on the management plan um, and then help you integrate that into other planning documents like your local hazard mitigation plan. Um, the second avenue is our transportation program. It's actually working with Barrytown to do an inventory. That program, we can fund 90% of the inventory. You provide the 10% match. And that is our staff going out, or we'll go out with your staff and do some sort of team effort. We do a lot of that with bridges and culvert inventories with different kinds of road inventories that your town road foreman are in involved with. And then the third way is we're there. You could just come and hire us. You can also hire other people. 
Um, Not us. Not us. Because, <laughs> but uh, we have staff who go out in the field and do a lot of inventories for towns. Mm -hmm. As part of this effort, I also wanted you to know, Elise talked about mapping. We're promoting because not many towns are taking advantages. That every town in our region is eligible for 12 free hours of mapping service every year. Mm -hmm. And that's your Conservation Commission, your Road Foreman, Select Board, Planning Commission, DRB, whoever needs maps, please know that that's out there. We're happy to provide more services than that, and we'll give you a cost estimate up front so you know whether those 12 free hours will take care of that. So EAB is one place where you can take your inventory and get hard copy maps of some of what you see here tonight did not count towards your 12 hours. <laughs> um, it can help with those planning tools. So then the second piece, I wanted to let you know is just we'll be doing just a survey how did we do tonight I'll send you a survey monkey link or Nancy will if you wouldn't mind filling that out we'd greatly appreciate it I, I do apologize that we did not get to the I activity know. again <laughs> and, I, and I want to follow up on Ginny's comment the landowner owns the trees they own the wood we tell road crews this all the time in practice a lot of time it gets removed you should have a conversation. If you are going to remove it, leave it there. I think you just got to up your PR to talk to them about, you know, move, taking it quickly off the, yep. off the right away. And I and another takeaway I heard was we got to find out about utility right away. Yeah, those are the two. 